We've got a hundred year old axe and some deer bones. Find out how I'll turn these two items into a delectable meal. All right guys, so I've been out here looking for deer, trying to figure out where the deer went. You know, scouting for hunting. And uh, I think I found my answer. Deer bone. Dead deer. So, there we go. Part of our answer. Anyway, question is, can we make use of this deer bone? And I think we can. Something that early humans used to do be to cook and eat the marrow. Long lost art, I suppose. Now we only think about meat, but most of the calories is actually in the fat of the animal hidden inside the bone. Most animals can't make use of this. That's why this bone's laying around here in the woods, unused, unloved. But modern humans have the ability to tame tough material like bone. We can smash it open and eat the marrow raw, or we can cook it, something that animals can't do. Animals can only crunch and grind, and that's a lot of work to get at the inside of a bone. But humans can smash, we can also use tools, and we can use heat. The only problem is, I don't have any heat with me. I don't have a lighter or matches. But, I can make friction fire. So, let's see if we can turn this bone into a meal. So this is the perfect place to start looking for a bow drill kit. I've got uh, some cedar behind me. My cedar's pretty much a go-to choice for me for bow drill. Uh, it's easy to identify. Anybody can identify a cedar tree. Uh, if you can find a stand like this, usually because it's so filled in that you'll find some of the central ones here that uh, are starting to rot. This one here, you can see it's losing its bark. This one here is losing its bark too, so it's on the way to drying. It's probably not totally dry, these ones here, I might not pick them. There's a good one behind here uh, that's starting to dry. Most of the bark is peeled off. That's what you want to find is, is uh, bark peeled off. We got my Boreal 21 here. It's a uh, fold-out saw, so it's packable. And all it needs is a little bit of assembly. And you are set to cut. There we go. So I'm gonna work away, I grab a couple pieces here. I'm gonna grab a little bit more than what I think I need. And uh, that way I'll have some options when I start actually producing the bow drill kit. Because you never know if your the one you select is gonna be right. It's kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And a lot, all the times you don't know before you start whether or not it's gonna work. So let's get working, grab a couple here, and then we'll head back. That's one piece, not a bad piece. You can see it's got a few knots. The knots are the bothersome part of using cedar. You usually don't get a very big section but that doesn't have nodules or branches coming out and that's gonna give you a little bit of a problem when you start whittling it down. So I'm gonna grab a couple more of these and uh, we'll head back and start working away on them. Pretty interesting story about this axe. It's a hundred years old, or so I think. It was found in a property that my brother and I co-own as a rental property. A lot of people have been asking what I do for a living. Part of it is rental property. So we found this in the walls of the house when we were renovating it. Hundred year old, look at that. We suspect it was used for hand hewing the timbers used to build it. It was an old farmhouse. It's got a little engraving on there. Looks like a C inside of a triangle. It's pretty cool. And it cuts great actually. So let's put it to use. Let's make ourselves a bow drill.
You shouldn't use a branch, you should use the actual trunk of the tree. Uh, the branches contain a little bit too much resin and wh while they are the right size, they, uh, they don't necessarily work and they're not dry in the core. So if you want to use a set right away, you need something that's fairly dried all the way to the core. And getting a dead standing tree like that uh, is almost guaranteed to be dry all the way down to the core. I like my spindles to be fairly big, but not too big, because they produce a lot more friction. So we need to turn this down into something that's a lot more manageable. So after a while, whittling, you're gonna end up with something like that. And uh, of course you wouldn't use the ax on the final product, but, and you don't want it to be smooth. You don't, you want a lot of rough edges, not perfectly round like you would get like a, a broomstick. So you want, you know, some rougher edges to bind on the string. Uh, this is fairly long, so you can see, you can see the top is a point. Very, very sharp point. And we don't want a lot of friction at the top. The bottom is gonna be a similar shape, but less pointed. You need a point at the start in order to get a um, burn in. If it's not sharp and pointy, then you won't, uh, it won't bind into the bore where you want it to, and it'll have it slipping all over the place. So that's the rough shape. It's uh, bigger than my thumb, maybe three or four times bigger. This is a big spindle. Uh, I'll start off this big, I can always make it smaller. And uh, so the next thing is we need to make a bow, drill, uh, bow and we need to get a bearing block. Bearing blocks made out of uh, wet wood uh, so that it reduces friction and doesn't create a lot of heat at the top. So the temptation with the bottom board is that you're gonna wanna take a nice, fairly straight piece of cedar and uh, this one has a nice crack in the middle and you're gonna wanna take your ax and you know chop it right in half. The problem with cedar is when you do that, it wants it wants to doesn't want to go in a nice straight line like you would expect in a hardwood. It wants to t twist, so you end up with. I mean, this is a pretty pretty straight. It's got a chunk out the middle, which I don't like. It's got a crack over here, which I don't like. So that was just made by chopping off the sides of it more and more until I produced something that was relatively flat. And now I'm just gonna clean it up a little bit more. Your ash is gonna fall down from the top down and it's gonna cool once it gets down to the bottom. So if you have it super thick, you know, by the time it gets down to the bottom, you're not gonna be able to heat it. So what you're doing is building up an ember bed and then you heat up the ember bed to light it into flame and it has to reach a certain temperature for that to happen. So if you have a very, very, very thick one, it's not gonna reach all the way down to the bottom and uh, it's not gonna heat up or it's just gonna take a lot longer. So you're gonna be making a nice bed of em or a bed of coals down the bottom or ember and, or dust and then eventually you're gonna heat it up. So thickness matters, but thicker is better. It is pretty flat, which I like. It's gonna sit nice, nice and flat on the bottom here. Okay. Next step, we need to get ourselves a bow and we need to get a wet bearing block. So the bow part can be made out of anything. I used cedar again here because cedar, the boughs tend to be bent anyway, which is what you want. Um, I just had one little piece of string in my bag, which I always keep just in case. It might be too short. You know, you think it's nice and loose and that's good or Loose is bad because you know you want it to be tight, but the problem is you still have to get this big thick spindle in there. And so the issue is now is it's super tight. And super tight's a blessing and a curse because while it's nice and tight and it won't slip when you're drilling, you hear it pop in there. It's actually not too bad. See, it's a, it's a, this is a massive spindle. I'm not sure if I want it that thick. So having it thick means that now I can, I can whittle it down a little bit more and that's gonna loosen the, you can hear how taut that is. It's a, it's a little bit too taut. And what's, what it's going to do is it's gonna bind in here, but it's also gonna, it's gonna wanna smooth this part out here 
because it's pulling so tight on that 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 string is going to basically make it smooth and then it's going to slip even more. So while you think it's good and tight at the start and that's and that's a good thing, it ends up being a, a bad thing in the long run. So um, I think I'm going to shave this down a little bit um, because the rope, you can see it's at the end here and at the end there and that's all I have to work with. So I'm going to modify this instead and uh, you can see how tall it is. It's probably, it's probably about a foot and a half, foot and a half tall and people, you know, ordinary people will do it about, you know, 10 inches. But if you fail in 10 inches, you're done, you're through. So we need to be a lot longer than that. Uh, not a lot longer, but we get multiple tries with this, remember. Okay, so let's, let's take a little bit of thickness off that and uh, we'll, get our, we'll get our bearing block next. So laying logs down like this is not absolutely necessary, but if we only got one shot at a fire, it's going to keep us up off the ground and it's going to make sure that our fire doesn't get put out by the moisture that's on the ground. We make a nice little base here, fill in the gaps like so. Birch bark's my absolute favorite fire starter. Uh, you know, you can't have enough of it. If you find a tree with, with birch bark shedding like this, just take it, take it all. Especially if you're in a crisis, this stuff lights up, burns really well. So I'm gonna use this as part of my bird's nest. Uh, and I'm also gonna grab some dry grass, which I know is back that way. So lots and lots of birch bark. And uh, people are pretty meticulous about the bird's nest having to be really dry. But if you get just a little touch of a flame and then you put it on this and transfer it over, you've got a fire, buddy. So this is behind me here, it's dry grass. It's another perfect tinder. It's part of a good tinder bundle. Um, I would personally mix a lot of the dry grass, birch bark and cedar bark along all together in a bird's nest. They all form a different function. The cedar smolders really well. The birch bark produces a flame and holds it. And the grass is a flash tinder, similar to a cattail. It'll take a flame, but it'll produce it really fast and it'll, go, and it'll go out right away. So let's get some grass here. Okay, so we're getting close. We're not there yet. I have a bag of tinder. I carry this with me. It's a uh, just a little satchel. I have cedar bark in here, which is so dry it makes a powder. Yeah, you don't want to breathe that in. So that's going to be part of my base. You can see, after you get your fibers, you can you can strip this off a tree. I found this off a dead tree. It was it was almost in this condition. But you can see how the fibers are all exposed. It's exactly what you want. You want exposed fibers. Um, if it's a, let's see, you know, if it's bark form like that, it won't catch. It, the fibers aren't exposed enough to catch the heat, and then it won't ignite. So small pieces. You do that in your spare time by the fire. You need it all out, and then when you have, when you need it, you have it. Uh, your cedar or your birch bark here. I'm gonna grab some. Same thing. As a full piece of bark, it won't work. So it won't work well. It will work, but it won't work well. You want that all broken up. Break it down into those little fibers like that, and you put that into your bird's nest. And I'm going to do the same thing 
with the grass over here. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna break up all the pieces into the fibers, which is a lot more work than you would expect. But you get the idea. So you gotta break it into the smallest possible fibers you can imagine, the individual little pieces. So that's your bird nest. So we've got three things in our bird nest. We've got cedar base, we're gonna put the grass underneath it, and we're gonna put our birch bark in the middle because we want the birch bark to carry the flame. And then once we get lit, we can turn it over. We'll get a flash, flash bird from here, and then we'll transfer that to the birch bark, and then we'll transfer that for our fire. Fire has to be ready, so we've got kindling here that I've grabbed from branches, okay? They are the ones up in the trees that stay dry all the time. The lower branches are bone dry. <laughs> I hit the camera there. Smaller the better. These tiny twigs are perfect for starting. And then you want to switch over to something bigger. I have uh, cut some cedar up and I would also recommend getting some hardwood. So you switch over from tinder bundle, twig, softwood, and then hardwood and then you have a fire. And then you wanna burn it up and let it drop back down and then you're ready for cooking. We have a top board here. I actually found it in my backpack. So instead of cutting another live tree, I'm gonna use the existing one that I have. Nothing special about it, just a piece of live tree, live edge, and a little bit green. Uh, you can wet the inside. There's, there's various tips, but I find it doesn't really work anyway you're still gonna get friction and you're still gonna get heat at the top. So what we're gonna do is make a little divot here where we want the hole to start. Now the trick is on this is we don't want it to be too close to the edge. We want it to be far enough away so that we won't fall out. We're in enough, it may be, this may be too close actually. We maybe wanna come back a little bit more because we don't want the spindle here to fall off the edge. So it's a little bit high for me. I would like it to be below my knee, but I think we can make do, we'll see. So you can see I've got my forearm. This is different from ordinary. Most people recommend that you lock in below your knee, um, but having this means that I barely have to do any work at all. In fact. I'm barely leaning on it. Now, the trick is it's a combination of downward force and speed. So your downward force and speed creates friction. And when you get sufficient amount of friction, it'll produce heat and the heat will produce what you want, which is fire. So you'll notice, I want you to pay attention, there's gonna be a change from a squeaky kind of dry to uh, very very dry binding. So the binding means you're starting to produce what you want, which is the heat. It's not there yet. You can hear the sound changing. Now we've got some good friction going. Lots of heat, lots of smoke. We want to burn in a little bit more. I have a groove. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. We are gonna draw a triangle. We're gonna do it just with the blade, not going through. A triangle toward the center, like a pie. Pie shape toward the middle. And we only want to go in a little bit into the center because if we go too far, it'll blow out, and if it blows out, then our spindle is gonna go all over the place. There we go, there's our notch. You can see it goes just inside the hole a little bit, and this is gonna get bigger and fatter as we drill down. But we've hollowed out, I've also hollowed out a notch at the bottom, so it's kind of V-shaped along the bottom as well. So V-shaped this way, V-shaped that way. And that's so that there's a little bit of a place for that ember to accumulate and still get some oxygen. 
So that's my hole. If you go, like I say, if you go too far in, you're gonna blow out and you're gonna lose your spindle. It's gonna pop out and you're gonna lose it. And if you don't go far enough, then that dust doesn't have anywhere to accumulate down here in the bottom. Everything has to be ready. The bird's nest has to be ready. The fire has to be ready. I've got some backup tinder over here with this, the dry grass. I've got a pile of logs over here. My plan is once I get it, I'm gonna let it sit and we have some time to wait. Then we're gonna transfer it over, blow it into flame, chuck it in here, get the birch bark on, throw this on and get going. That squeak's bad, it's gonna switch. Okay, we're riding up a little bit, which we don't want. Okay, I don't like where I'm at. I'm making good dust. It's working fine. I just don't like that it's riding up. It's very close, but it's not there. Okay. I'm not gonna get rid of the dust. That dust is really good dust. We're gonna use it. So this is gonna be it, I think, here. And we don't want to do anything here right now. We just want to leave it. Let it smolder a bit. Now, if we move it too fast, it's going to fall apart. The fire right now is helping to bind it together. So we just want to leave it here for now. And we're going to, we won't, we don't want it to break apart. We have to be careful with the clump here. Bring you over and you have a look. There you go, smoking. We, we have a lot of time now. We don't have to worry about anything. Things don't have to be done quickly now. So what we want to do is, because it's kind of stuck in there, we need to get it out without it breaking apart. So we want to give it a little bit more oxygen now. So it kind of fell, we could have lost it there. All that dust is still good. Oh, and I screwed up. I screwed up, I screwed up, I screwed up. Okay. It's stuck to the bottom. Now we gotta salvage it. Okay. Now it's a little bit more precarious. Which you don't like. Like that too much. Okay. Ooh, that's hot.
actually think there's a bit of meat left on this I can still eat. Let's cook it, find out if it's still edible. Yep. How does that look? It's a little burnt. A little burnt. Here's some juicy bits. It's pretty juicy. A little pink on the inside. There's a kneecap. And some good fat around that joint. You see all the fat here. There's another chunk. There's nothing wrong with this meat. It's hard for a, it's hard for an animal to pick this off because they don't have a knife, obviously. You see, I got more than a couple mouthfuls off here. I can keep picking at it. But the next step here is, what I want to do is, I want to get the marrow out. So I'm going to heat it up a little bit more to make sure that the marrow is nice and cooked. And then I'm going to take the axe and I'm going to cut off this end and this end and I'm going to try to hopefully get the marrow out that way. Another good way to get the marrow out is simply by boiling it. Cutting the both ends off before boiling it, dropping it in and then that marrow will all come out, make a nice broth. What we're going to do is caveman style, as if we don't have any tools, although we do have tools. And I'm not going to smash it open with a rock because it just makes a mess. But that's exactly how primitive people would have done it. This meat's good. Here's a couple mouthfuls off here. More to come if I wanted. Put this back on the fire. This bone here, they chopped open with the axe. And you can see the marrow inside here. It's like a fatty mess. You can eat it raw. Primitive tribes would do that, eat it raw. Um, but it's frozen. So it's another reason why animals can't use it. So this is gonna have to go on the fire. I'm concerned now that I opened it up, it's gonna leak out. Uh, I do have a pot here, but I don't think it's gonna fit in the pot. So we'll take our risks here and uh, we'll hope it doesn't all leak out. Yeah, there's a bunch more in here. Interesting stuff, good stuff. History of humans, man. This is exactly how we started ruling the planet. Making use of everything, not just muscle, but also the marrow, the brain, everything, the eyes. We ate everything and we could, and we could do it very easily because we had the tools to do it and the intelligence to do it. Big brains need either a big digestive system or a lot of fat. And we switched from eating lots of food in volume to eating more calorie dense foods. So we traded in our big digestive system for a big brain and then we used our big brain to get at these things here that were not very easy to come by. Bone marrow, key part, bone marrow and brains. That's hot. Ah, I got my straw bed. It's kind of awkward looking, doesn't it look? My legs all weird out like that. Okay. It's kind of the only way to fit in the frame. We got a bunch of raw, raw leg bones over here too. Okay, let's get rid of the raw ones. All right, so. Here we go, there's our bone. I'm gonna get my glove so dirty and gross. You know early humans discovered this by totally by accident. You know, they probably would have thrown their waist on the fire and then, you know, kids being kids, would have taken rocks and smashed them up and then there would have, some goo would have came out and the kids would have been like, what's that? 
kids always put stuff in their mouth. And so there you go. The kids start eating it. The parents said, don't eat that. Or rah, 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 something like that. And the kids would have been like, oh, it's good. And they would have went back to it and ate more. Or, you know, maybe the adults figured it out first. Who knows? People complain I'm not sanitary. You're not very sanitary. So, it's a bush, man. This is the only time you get not to be sanitary. Of course, we're going to get lots of shards of bone in here, but... I guess we'll deal with that later. There we go. Nice creamy mess on the inside. Here we go. You see the bone's hollow and it's got lots of juicy flavor in there. So let's give it a go. Can anybody guess what it's going to taste like? Shards of bone, no doubt. Mm. Mm. Whoa. Mm. That's like butter, no doubt, right? It's coating the top of my mouth. Well, people have said that about venison. We don't like to eat the venison fat because it coats the mouth. This has a high melting point. So it's wanting to, and might once it gets in my mouth, to immediately harden. Once it goes in, it's very oily. And then it sticks on your mouth, right on your palate. It's very, 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 very rich. Like I can feel myself getting full. Like I've only eaten, you know, a tablespoon. But I actually feel energy coming back already. I feel full. Which is surprising. I was <clears throat> doing all this work, I was quite hungry. That's a meal right there. Get yourself a little scrambling stick. That's only part, like a very small part of the bone. Like, after that. Mm. Wow. Very oily. It's coating my teeth, it's coating my palate. After a while, it kind of melts again. You can see how prehistoric man, modern prehistoric man, would have gorged on this sort of stuff. You know, and then cooking helps, helps so you can break these pieces of meat off. You know, having a knife to cut it off, super valuable. Something that an animal can't do. But once that flesh is cooked, tears off. There you go guys, eat the marrow. An animal is more than just muscle. It's everything. Good stuff guys. Well, I hope you guys learned something. I'm gonna finish off my lunch, scavenger's lunch. I'll join you on the next one. A lot more to come, guys. This channel's just getting started. If you enjoy this, hit the like button if you want. Subscribe or not, I don't care. Cheers. Scavenging. A lot of people say you shouldn't eat snow. I'm going to dispel a myth right now because I'm kind of tired of the you know, eating snow myth. Les Stroud kind of came up with it, but then he backed off and said, I believe he said that eating snow is fine as long as you're active and warm, which I totally agree with. If you're hypothermic, it's already too late. 
If you're hyperthermic to the point where you can't go up and do exercise to raise your core temperature, it's too late. But if you're going to die from thirst or eat snow, eat snow. Because if, if you're going to die from dehydration, which is pretty normal in a situation where it's very cold to get dehydrated because your body's respiring so much and the air temperature is so cold that a lot of the moisture is leaving. When you're bringing air in, you're having to moisturize it so that your body can actually use it. So eating a handful of snow, as long as it's not yellow, perfectly fine. Your body's going to heat it up. Now, if you have a source of heat where you can put it in a pot and heat it, and then drink it, all the better. But you have to make a fire in order for that to happen, and that's going to burn calories. In a lot of cases, it's easier just to burn calories to heat the snow as you take it in than to make a fire, which costs calories, in order to heat the water up. Now, if you have a fire anyway, yes, heat the snow up and eat it. But if you don't, and you have no, no way of making fire, or fire is becoming very expensive, and you're in your last little bit of energy reserves, eat snow. I know it's very nuanced, but you just have to use your brain. Use your common sense. If you're thirsty and you're very active and you're sweating, eat snow. It's going to help cool your body down and it's going to give you moisture. What your body needs. So since people are going to be asking me about this anyway, it's at Gawa Canyon. It's uh, Boreal 21 saw. Um, collapsible. It's really cool. And, uh, you know, I've been using that cheap uh, brand saw for a long time. It's kind of been driving me nuts because I can't pack it. This one's packable. All you do is pull the back out, like so. You fold it around, back together, down, and Log it back. That's your bow saw, guys. So, Agawa, uh, look up, just type in Boreal 21 and it'll come up. I think I have that on my Amazon. Fold down, out, around, lock it in the back here, like so. Fold it up, watch fingers, bam. You got yourself a bow saw. Love this saw. Only used it a little bit. They sent me two. I actually approached them, so they didn't, they're not paying me to do this, they're not paying me to say this, but they did give me two free saws, and so far I'm really enjoying them. Throw this in my backpack and I can carry it now. No worrying about stupid pool noodles. I used to have a pool noodle on my buck saw. It was so annoying, but this works great.